We are in the book of John tonight, the Gospel of John. In fact, Lord willing, we're going to finish chapter 14 this evening. And next week, we will begin the Sermon on the Mount. Looking very, very forward to that. But if you'll stand with me, please. John chapter 14, beginning in verse 28. Does anybody need a Bible? If you do, please just lift your hand up and we'll get you one. And then welcome to those of you who are visiting with us this evening. We're glad to have you with us as visitors. And uh, we pray that the Lord will uh, bless you and make you feel right at home. John chapter 14, give you a minute to get there, verse 28 through 31. Verse 28, remember what I told you, I am going away, but I will come back to you again. If you really loved me, you would be happy that I am going to the Father who is greater than I am. I have told you these things before they happen, so that when they do happen, you will believe. I don't have much more time to talk to you because the ruler of this world approaches. He has no power over me, but I will do what the Father requires of me so that the world will know that I love the Father. Come, let's be going. Let's pray, please. Well, Father, the words of your Son, let's be going, means he went to the cross, he died, he was buried, he was risen from the dead. And for those of us who have come to faith in Christ, we are also going on our way to heaven. So thank you, Father, for the hope we have We pray, Lord, that you would help us and teach us to rejoice in hope of glory and this evening that you would open our eyes to the word of God. May we grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is in his name that we pray, amen. Well, please be seated. The title of the message this evening is, and it's an interesting title, and it's an interesting message. The title is, What Did Jesus' Death Mean to Him? What did Jesus' death mean to him? We most often think in terms of what Jesus' death means to us, but the study this evening is going to focus on what Jesus' death means to him. A professor, Leon Morris, has summarized what Jesus' death means to us, and I'd like to just take you through these very quickly. If you'll turn, please, to Romans chapter 5, verse 9, Romans chapter 5, verse 9, just as a quick refresher of what Jesus' death means to us, and then we'll look at what Jesus' death means to him. In Romans chapter 5, verse 9, it means we are justified. Verse 9 says, and since we have been made right, or justified in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. So for those of us who have placed our faith in Christ, we now stand justified before God. A very quick definition of that in layman's terms that I'm just easy to remember is God views you now as a Christian just as if you had never sinned. Look with me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, one book over to the right. And we're going to go from left to right tonight to make it easy. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25.
And in verse 25, we're told that his blood has established a new covenant with us. In verse 25, in the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. And then in the book of Ephesians, a few books over to the right, please. One that you're very familiar with, the book of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. We're told that he has redeemed us, or he has purchased us. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. Just two books to the right, please. The book of Colossians in chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. We're told that we are reconciled to God. Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. We're reconciled to God. It says, and through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by the means of Christ's blood on the cross. And then in verse, uh, chapter 2 of that same book, verse 14, we're told that his cross, by his cross, peace with God has been secured. Verse 14, he canceled the record of the charges against us. Isn't that tremendous? He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to his cross. And then if you turn with me, please, to the book of Titus, several books over after First and Second Timothy, the book of Titus in chapter 2, Titus chapter 2, there in verse 14. And we're just looking quickly at a, a brief summary of what Christ's death means to us. Titus chapter 2, verse 14. He gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us and to make us his very own people totally committed to doing good deeds. And then over to the right, the book of Hebrews, please, chapter 9, right next door, Hebrews chapter 9, in verse 14, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. We are cleansed. It says in verse 14, just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. And then in chapter 10, please, verse 14. Chapter 10, verse 14. We are perfected or accepted forever. Verse 14, for by that one offering, he forever made perfect or complete those who are being made holy. And then back up to chapter, excuse me, verse 10 in that chapter, we are sanctified or set apart to God forever, Hebrews 10, 10. For God's will was for us to be made holy or sanctified or set apart to God for his exclusive use by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. And then in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, we have boldness to enter the place, the holy place. 
And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And then in Hebrews chapter 13, a lot in chapter 13, is uh, Hebrews, isn't there? Hebrews chapter 13 in verse 12 excuse me, verse, um, yeah, verse 12. So also Jesus suffered and died outside the city gates to make his people holy or sanctified forever. Let me read that again. So also Jesus suffered and died outside the city gates to make his people holy by means of his own blood. And then in the book of Revelation, please, chapter 5. Revelation, of course, the last book in the Bible. Revelation chapter 5, in verse 9. We're told that we've been purchased unto God. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. We'll be singing this song when we arrive in heaven. And they sang a new song with these words. You, speaking of Jesus, are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it. For you were slaughtered, and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. So we've been purchased unto God by the blood of Christ. We've also been loosed from our sins in that same verse. And then in Revelation chapter 12, please. Revelation 12, verse 11. We may overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 12, verse 11. And they have defeated him, that would be the accuser, Satan, and they have defeated him by the blood of the Lamb and by their testimony and they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. So um, thank you for that little 15 uh, passage journey through the New Testament, looking at just a, a little Whitman sampler, if you will, of the truths that are ours because of the death of Christ. But our passage tonight reveals four aspects of what Jesus' death meant to him. Now think about that. I would bet you that none of us, including yours truly, have ever thought about what does, well, I, I have a little bit, but not as much as we're going to look at tonight. But what did Jesus' death mean to him? So we're looking inside of the mind and the heart of Christ just prior to his going to the cross. And then each aspect of his death, each aspect of his death reflects an important part of his work and so on. So we're going to look at th this, that first of all, that his ministry would be vindicated. That's the first thing I want to look at tonight. His ministry would be vindicated. We're talking now, what did Christ's death or his ministry mean? It meant that his ministry would be vindicated. Please look in John 14, 28, the last part of it. John 14, 28. I am going to the Father who is greater than I am. So after Jesus' humiliation in the incarnation, he longed to go to the Father. And when I say after Jesus' humiliation, I don't mean it quite in the same way that we would speak of being humiliated where we would be embarrassed. Rather, I'm thinking of it, and the Bible is thinking of it, in terms of his humility. Jesus, who had been with the Father forever, humbled himself 
into what is called the incarnation, a good word for us to become familiar with. It simply means that God became a human being, um, the incarnation of Christ. So after he humbled himself in the incarnation while he was here upon the earth, guess what he really longed to do? He longed to go back to heaven. You know, everybody wants to go home, don't they? When they've left their home, it's exciting to go somewhere, but after a while, there's no place like what? Like home. Well, Jesus was God. He had been with the Father and the Holy Spirit forever. That had been his home. He came here willingly. He uh, finished his ministry, but he longed as a man and as God. He longed to go back to heaven. And so when we, when we look at this verse, I am going to the Father who is greater than I am, the reference here is to two things, his restoration in heaven and his exaltation to the Father's right hand or his ascension to the Father's right hand. Ascension is another important word that you and I should become familiar with. And by the way, I'm going to try as we go through all of our messages to just throw out these little words that are good for us to know. The ascension means when he ascended to heaven. You may recall in the book of Acts chapter 1, as he was there with the disciples, he was talking with them. And all of a sudden, as he was talking with them, without any um, mention to, to them that he was going to leave, without any indication that he was going to leave, he was taken up into heaven into a cloud. And so they were talking to him, listening to him, and the next thing they know he's starting to physically go up, and he went up out of sight. And where he went to is to heaven, and he sat down, the book of Hebrews chapter 1 tells us, he sat down at the right hand of God. I always like to say the next part seems odd to me, but there appeared unto them, the disciples, two men in white robes, no doubt angels, and they said this, what I think is a funny thing. They said, why are you guys standing here looking up into heaven like that? Do you get it? I mean, I would say to them, what planet are you from? I mean, do you realize what just happened? Not only did he ascend, but he's been resurrected, and you're asking us why we're we're looking the way we do. And then they said to him, they said, listen, as you've seen him go, you're going to see him come back. And so they began to talk about the second coming. So in John 14, 28, when he says, I am going to the Father who is greater than I am, that's what he's speaking of. He's speaking of his exaltation to heaven and then his restoration, his getting back together with the Father. As a man, though he was sinless, he experienced fatigue, he experienced weariness, he experienced hunger, he experienced thirst, he experienced tears, he experienced grief. All of the things that you and I experience in this life. I mean, I was talking with... Um, who was I talking with tonight? I was talking with somebody before the service tonight. It was Mike. We were talking about um, this life and, and about our relationship with Christ and about the fact that we're going to heaven. But as Jesus said, in the world, you will have tribulations. And of course, life is filled with trouble. So when Jesus was here as a man, he also experienced the trouble that you and I go through. In fact, he was tempted to sin 
in every way that you and I have been tempted to sin, except he did not sin. So when he says, I am going to the Father, if you were to put it in our terms, he's saying in, in a nice way, he's saying, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> I'm going back to heaven. I'm going to be with my Father. And so he was yearning for that glory. You've certainly been on trips, haven't you, when maybe it's a long trip from Japan or somewhere, 12, 13, 14 hour flight, and the closer you get to home, the more you want to get there. You just have a yearning to be home. If you turn with me, please, to John 17, we see some of that yearning. And while you're turning there, please uh, consider this again. And we like to say it over and over. He was a man. He was God, but he was a man. So he really, really had these desires as a man. Excuse me, John 17, 1. <clears throat> After saying all these things, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come, meaning his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. Then he said, glorify your son so he can give glory back to you. Arriving in heaven, he would now receive excuse me, even upon his resurrection, he would have a glorified body. And so Jesus was longing to have that glorified body, which at this point he did not have. He had a human body. Look in John 17, 5 with me, please. He says, and he's continuing in his, what has often been called his high priestly prayer. He says, now, Father, Bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. So in being exalted to the Father's right hand, Christ's ministry would be vindicated or it would be blameless. His exaltation and the culmination of his Father's approval would be revealed uh, his approval of his earthly life and death. In other words, when the Lord, when the Father received him up into heaven, he was saying, my son is blameless. Let me ask you this. What man can enter into heaven unless he is as perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect, right? Jesus was completely righteous as a man. He fulfilled the law perfectly. He never sinned. He came here to perform a ministry, and his exaltation now would be the culmination of his father's approval of what he did in his earthly life and in his death. Here's the idea. Because Christ had accomplished his father's will perfectly, he eagerly looked forward to his father's heavenly presence where he would return to full glory. Now, we talk about, I can't wait to get to heaven, right? We say that. We often say, I'm, I'm ready to go to heaven right now. We'll say things like, I wish I could go right now. We say those kinds of things. And we mean it because we actually have a down payment on heaven. Uh, the fullness of our redemption, the Holy Spirit of God. The Bible says, let me slow down a bit. The Bible says, now we see through a glass darkly. So we, we have a little bit of feeling, we have a little bit of sight, but it's enough for the Christian who is assured of their salvation, I want to go to heaven. I'm longing to go to heaven. But for Christ, who had lived there eternally, and he, he knew more than a little glimpse, he knew the full glory of heaven. He was longing to get back to that, longing to get back to that. He would then return to full glory. 
And even though the cross would be excruciating, Jesus knew that the Father was going to raise him from the dead. And these are important thoughts, by the way, for us to consider. I think many times as believers, and rightly so, we have a little trouble understanding the fact that he was God and he was man. And, and so whenever he acted, was he acting as man or acting as God? Um, it's a mystery. But within himself, he knew, of course, that God was going to raise him from the dead. And he knew that God was going to seat him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. So he knew that. He was excited about that. One Christian pastor captures the essence of what it meant to Jesus to return to the Father. Let me read it to you. If, the, if Jesus' disciples truly loved him, they would be glad that he is returning to his Father, for he is returning to the sphere where he belongs, to the glory he had with the Father before the world began, to the place where the Father is, undiminished in glory, unquestionably greater than the Son in his incarnate state. To this point, the disciples have responded emotionally entirely according to their perception of their own gain or loss. And let me pause here. You'll remember chapter 14 begins with, don't let your hearts be troubled and so on. He had just indicated to them, I'm going to be leaving you. So after three and a half years with them, he said, and again, he didn't say, hey, I've got a message, which I've got something to tell you. It's very important. I'll break it to you later. He just, boom, told them. So from that point on, all the way through the 14th chapter, the 15th and the 16th, he's trying to comfort them and encourage them. What they are thinking about this entire time is, we're going to miss you. You know, we love you. But we're going to miss you. So what is being said here is, and let me repeat this last portion, to this point, the disciples have responded emotionally entirely according to their perception of their own gain or loss. All they're thinking about is themselves. Now remember, if they truly had loved him is the point. So if they had loved Jesus they would have perceived his departure to his own home was his gain, and they would have rejoiced with him at the prospect. And wouldn't that be true if you and I were somewhere, let's say in Japan, I've been there so many times, I, I use it as an example, and I've been with many other believers from California and, and sometimes people are going home earlier than I am and boy I'm happy for them they're going home or when I was in Vietnam we called it going home we called it going back to the world and Marines did 13 months the army did 12 just wanted to note that and um, you know factual information is important but um, when you're with a fellow Marine who's what we would call a short timer, maybe he's got 15, 20, 30 days left, you're looking at him saying, man, you're going home, keep your head low, and they would try to keep you out of situations. So, you know, if you've made it this far, they don't want to lose you in the last month. But, but you'd be so happy for them that they're going home. You'd want to you'd wanna go with them, you know, but what happened with the disciples, it was they were grieving. And I don't fault them for this, but their grief was an index of their self-centeredness. I don't fault them. They were only thinking about themselves. He said, hey, guys, I'm going. And remember, he told them a couple times, and he tells them here, but I'm coming back. He even said, when I go, guess what? 
I'm going to be preparing a place, a bed, where you can take a nice sleep if you're really tired. If you, if you get real tired when you're in heaven, I'll have a bed just for you where you can take a nap. He didn't say that. I said that just to help us stay awake if you're napping. <laughs> I love you. I just don't want you to miss it. But who are we to look at them and say, oh, they were self-centered? Excuse me. Is there somebody here who doesn't battle with being self-centered? Not a one of us. We all do. But what Jesus said to them was, I'm going to be with the Father who is greater than I am. So his ministry would be vindicated or he would prove to have been blameless by being received up into heaven. And then secondly, his message would be verified or proved. Look with me, please, to verse 29, 1429. I have told you these things before they happen so that when they do happen, you will believe. Let me read that again. I have told you these things, everything in chapter 14, before they happen so that when they do happen, you will believe. So what Jesus was doing here is he was strengthening their wavering faith by reminding them. Now, the disciples knew from the Old Testament that only God can predict the future. If you'll turn to Isaiah, please, chapter 42 with me for a moment. Isaiah chapter 42. Now remember, Jesus is telling them these things before they happen. They knew that only God could predict the future. Look what is said in Isaiah 42, 9, please. Isn't this an interesting study so far? I, I hope it's got you a little bit. Um, Isaiah 42, 9. This is the, the Father speaking. Everything I prophesied has come true, and now I will prophesy again. I will tell you the future before it happens. How about in Isaiah 46, 9 through 10? You know, Madam Sophia up here on the east side of the 99 with the pink house, which has long ago needed a repainting because it's faded. She pretends to tell the future. She cannot. Only God knows the future. Isaiah 46, 9 through 10. Remember the things I have done in the past? For I alone am God. I am God. And there is none like me. Only I can tell you the future before it even happens. Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish. So when he said, remember the things I've done in the past, he was saying to them, I told you about those things that were going to happen as well. How about Isaiah chapter 48, verse 3? And where we are here is that the disciples knew full well from the Old Testament that only God can predict the future. In Isaiah chapter 48, verse 3, he says, Long ago, I told you what was going to happen. Then suddenly, I took action and all my predictions came through. And then in Isaiah 48, 5, Isaiah 48, 5. That is why I told you what would happen. I told you beforehand what I was going to do. Then you could never say, my idols did it. My wooden image and metal God commanded it to happen. So, when the predictions of Jesus came to pass, guess what happened to the faith of the disciples? Now remember, he told them what was going to happen. In fact, he told them, I have told you these things before they happen so that when they do happen, you will believe. 
their faith would be increased. Look with me to the Gospel of John, please, chapter 2. John chapter 2. And their faith certainly was increased. Anyone here that doesn't want to have their faith increased, I would imagine not a one. We're all happy to have our faith increased. John chapter 2, verse 19. All right, Jesus replied, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Verse 20. What? They exclaimed. It has taken 46 years to build this temple and you can rebuild it in three days. But when Jesus said this temple, he meant his own body. Go back to verse 19, please. Jesus replied, destroy this temple or my body, and in three days I will raise it up. Verse 22, after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this, and they believed both the scriptures and what Jesus had said. How about John 16, while we're in the Gospel of John? Please turn to verse chapter 16. This is speaking of Bible prophecy, Bible prophecy. John 16, verse, actually verse 1. I have told you these things so that you won't abandon your faith. For you will be expelled from the synagogues, and the time is coming when those who kill you will think they are doing a holy service for God. This is because they have never known the Father or me. Yes, I'm telling you these things now so that when they happen, you will remember my warning. I didn't tell you earlier because I was going to be with you for a while longer. And let me just say this, that, you know, when you are reading the Bible, you're hearing a Bible message, and the Lord speaks to you about something, and he's speaking to you about something that is going to happen. He's making a promise to you. And as you wait upon him, and then what he said to you comes to pass, guess what it does to your faith? It encourages you, doesn't it? It encourages you. And that's simply what the Lord was saying to them. Here's something also very interesting, that despite the Lord's many predictions, let me repeat that again, because I want to make sure you're, you're getting it. But despite the Lord's many predictions of his resurrection, the disciples did not fully believe until after it actually happened. Can you remember reading many times in the Gospels where Jesus would say, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'll be crucified, I'll be buried, and I'll rise from the dead. Do you remember that? He would say that over and over and over. And guess what happened? It just went right over their head. So even though he told them what was going to happen, many times they didn't really believe it until after it happened. John records that it was only when Peter and John found the empty tomb that they actually believed that he was risen. Look in John 20 with me, please. John 20. In John 20, verse 8, Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. So he had been told over and over and over, I was going to be raised from the dead. But it was, and Norris, was it Peter who outran John? I think it was, yeah. Peter outran John. So the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went into the tomb, and he saw that it was empty, and then what happened? He believed in the resurrection of Christ. In verse 9, until then, they still hadn't understood the scripture, scriptures 
that said Jesus must rise from the dead. So the point here is the fulfillment of his predictions or his prophecies helped convince the disciples of Jesus's deity just as he had intended. He was all the while trying to help them. And may I say this, you and I as his disciples are no different, we're, we're no different in many ways uh, to these disciples. The Lord wants to help us with our faith. He wants to help you with your faith. He loved them. He called them to be with him. He loved you. He died for you. He's called you to be with him. He's not mad at you. He's not playing cat and mouse with you. He loves you very, very much. He understands that our frames are but dust. He knows our weaknesses. And he's trying to help each one of us in our walk with Jesus Christ. And he does it through his word. That's why every word in the Bible is so, so important. In John 14, 30, Jesus says, I don't have much more time to talk to you. Um, when he says, I don't have much more time to talk to you, that does not signal the end of his talk, which actually continued through chapter 16. Rather, those words are a reminder to the disciples that his time on earth was drawing to a close. He said, I don't have much more time to talk to you. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be buried. I'm going to be in that grave for three days. He's letting them know what was going to happen. Jesus was fully aware of all that was about to happen to him. Jesus was never taken by surprise. He knew exactly how much time he had left with the 11 before the servants of the enemy came to seize him. He was in complete control of himself. He understood every circumstance. In fact, when he died on the cross, it was his decision to give up his spirit. So his ministry would be vindicated that he was blameless. His message would be verified that it was proved that he rose from the dead. And then thirdly, his mission would be victorious or successful. He came to earth with a mission and his mission was successful. Look with me please in John 14:30. Jesus says, because the ruler of this world approaches, he has no power over me. This, by the way, is the second of three references in John's gospel to Satan. Uh, he believed, of course, there was a devil. Um, and he refers to Satan as the ruler of this world. Look with me, please, to John chapter 13, verse 31. John 13, 31. In John 13, 31, Jesus says, the time for judging this world has come when Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out. Now, the devil, of course, is not the legitimate ruler of the world. He is a divinely appointed usurper. He is the God of this world, but he's not the legitimate ruler of this world. God has allowed him to have this position. He is the ruler of the evil world system that is in rebellion against God. Look with me in 1 John, please, chapter 2. 1 John, chapter 2. You get a workout with your Bible here, don't you, huh? I was talking to somebody the other day, and they said, uh, they said, I think I'm beginning to learn where pages, places are in my Bible. I'm not going to talk about that other matter. Don't you worry. It was a, I'll tell you a little story. 
There was a man, he is so, so sweet. He's been attending this fellowship for many, many years. And you know, I make little jokes about using your phone and all that. And he's so sweet, he came up to me last Sunday. And this is why I'm not gonna make that statement, even though it's true, I won't make it anymore. Um, he said, Pastor Bob, he said, I'm unable to even hold a Bible. He's got a, a serious disease in his hands. And he said, I can barely touch the screen on my phone. And he was trying to let me know why he didn't have a Bible. And I told him, I said, listen, it's okay. <laughs> it is okay. And I'm so sorry. And, and we prayed about it. It's just a disease that won't go away. But what a sweet man, you know. He, do you get it? You know. So for those of you who do not have that affliction, <laughs> but wait a minute. I said I wasn't going to talk about it. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. First John chapter 2. This world system of which the devil is the ruler Verse 15, do not love this world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. So Jesus saw Satan coming. Remember, he said in the verse, because the ruler of this world approaches, he has no power in me. Jesus saw Satan coming in the person of who? Yeah, Judas. He was the one at the Last Supper, who was, uh, Satan came into him, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct, Norris? At the Last Supper, Satan came into him, and then he, of course, went and got the contingency of the soldiers. So when he said the ruler of this world is coming, he was thinking of Satan inside of Judas, who would shortly then participate in his arrest there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus had been in conflict, in conflict with Satan throughout his life. In fact, when he was an infant, do you remember what happened? Satan provoked Herod to try to kill him along with the other male children in the area of Bethlehem. May I make one comment completely off scripture here? I rarely do this, but I'm going to say it here tonight. No, no, this is not a joke. I rarely do this, but I'm going to say it here tonight. All of the trouble going on in Washington today and over this last week in my opinion, it may not be yours. You know what Roe versus Wade is, right? Mm -hmm. In my opinion, what the left is fighting for in their opposition to this particular nominee to the Supreme Court is their fear that they will one day see Roe versus Wade overturned. Now, Jesus said the devil is a liar, and he is what else? He's a murderer. So Satan, who is the god of this world, who unbelievers are obeying, unknown to them, these people are fighting they don't necessarily put it all together, but they are fighting to be able to continue to murder children. 
Does that make sense to you? Satan is a murderer. It's a heavy thought. It's a very real reality. And uh, I wanted to just, I was, wanted to say that Sunday, just, you know, it's so helpful to be able to view the world through the lens of Scripture. You know, why would people do certain things? Well, scripture teaches us that. But we're talking now, if you'll turn in Matthew chapter 2 with me, please. Matthew chapter 2. We're talking about how Jesus had been in conflict with Satan throughout his whole life, and now Satan was coming to arrest him, if you will. But in Matthew chapter 2, verse 16, the beginning of that conflict where Satan threw Herod, it says Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. So when Jesus began his public ministry, what happened? Look with me to Mark chapter 1, please. And we're talking about Satan's opposition to Jesus. When he began his public ministry in Mark chapter 1, verse 13, we're told that Jesus was tempted by Satan. It says in Mark 1, 13, where he was tempted by Satan for 40 days. He was out among the wild animals, and angels took care of him. So here we are in the Garden of Gethsemane, and in just a few short hours, Jesus' lifelong conflict with the devil would reach its triumphant climax. The idea here is Satan would finally succeed in having him killed, but in doing so would bring about his own destruction. Look with me in 1 John, please, chapter 3, verse 8. Jesus was far from being Satan's victim. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. But when people keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to the devil who has been sinning since the beginning. But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. And then if you'll go back to Hebrews chapter 2, please, verse 14. And let me pause again because uh, I certainly hope that in saying what I just said about Roe versus Wade, that anyone here who has had an abortion, uh, if I've upset you or offended you, I certainly am sorry. I didn't have that in my mind, um, you know when I said what I said, but uh, you know as a Christian that God has forgiven you, but I, I'm sorry if I did offend you or trouble you. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14, because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. So the idea here is that the cross marked Satan's ultimate defeat, though the final sentence against him isn't going to be carried out until the end of the millennium. And at that point, his final assault against God's people is going to be thwarted and he will be cast into the lake of fire where he will be punished for all eternity. I'll just read it to you. Revelation 2.10 says, Then the devil who had deceived them, it's chapter 20, I believe, then the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur 
joining the beast and the false prophet, there they will be tormented day and night forever. So the point here is that Jesus' emphatic declaration where he says, the devil has no power over me, explains why the devil could not hold him in death. The phrase in he the Hebrew idiom, meaning the devil could make no legal claim against Jesus. How could he, asked a pastor. Jesus is not of this world. He has never sinned. The devil could have a hold on Jesus only if there were a justifiable charge against Jesus. Jesus' death would then be his due and the devil's triumph. So we've looked at his ministry would be vindicated, his message would be verified, his mission would be victorious or successful, and then fourthly, I'd like to look at his motivation would be validated or confirmed. John 14, verse 31. John 14, 31. He says, but I will do, John 14, 31. But I will do what the Father requires of me so that the world will know that I love the Father. Come, let's be going. So far from marking his defeat at the hands of Satan, Christ's death was the ultimate proof to the world of his love for the Father. And he had just emphasized that the essential test of love is obedience. So Jesus would demonstrate his love for the Father by doing exactly what the Father commanded him. And by the way, that is how you and I demonstrate our love to God, isn't it? By obeying him. We don't obey him in order to be saved, but because we are saved, we obey him. When he said, come, let us be going, it's signaling an obvious transition in the story here. At this point, Jesus and the disciples evidently left the upper room where they had the Lord's Supper, the Passover Supper, supper excuse me, and they began walking through Jerusalem, headed for Gethsemane, and while they walked, Jesus continued his teaching. In fact, in John 18, 1, it says this, after saying these things, Jesus crossed the Kidron Valley with his disciples and entered a grove of olive trees. So they were leaving the city of Jerusalem, crossing the Kidron Valley east of the city, and Gethsemane lay across the valley on the slopes of the Mount of Olive. The sum of all that Jesus' death meant to him, guess what it is? Can you imagine? What was the sum of all of what his death meant to him? Have you ever thought of it? You put it all together. What was the one thing that his dying meant? It was joy. It meant joy. Look with me in Hebrews chapter 12, please, verse 2. Imagine that. It was joy. That was what it meant to him, going to the cross. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. So the idea here is that the path to eternal joy led through suffering. First, it was the agony of the cross. Then it was the ecstasy of heaven, and there was no other way. The passion of Christ did not merely precede the crown. It was the price, and the crown was the prize. He died to have it. He triumphed over death. 
he returned to the glory that he had from all eternity in heaven. Turn with me, please, to John chapter 13, verse 31. John 13, 31. As soon as Judas left the room, Jesus said, the time has come for the Son of Man, John 13, 31. The time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory, and God will be glorified because of him. And since God receives glory because of the Son, he will give his own glory to the Son, and he will do, it, he will do so at once. So Jesus is now seated at the right hand of the Father. He's gone into heaven. And right there, he's receiving forever the unceasing, undiminished praise of those living creatures and the elders who cry out, singing in a mighty chorus, worthy is the lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor, glory and blessing. Charles Spurgeon said this, what is heaven? It is the place which his love suggested, which his genius invented, which his bounty provided, which his royalty has adorned, which his wisdom has prepared, which he himself glorif glories, in that heaven you are to be with him forever. John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace, once said this, quote, when I get to heaven, I shall see three wonders there. The first will be to see so many people there that I did not expect to see. The second, to miss many that I did expect to see. And the third and greatest wonder of all will be to find myself there. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. We've never, I've never really thought much about what it meant to him but these verses certainly give us a, a deep, deep description. And we pray, Lord, for our beginning now in the Sermon on the Mount. And Lord, we pray that you might put an interest in people's hearts to come and to learn from the very sermon that Jesus preached as we begin in the Beatitudes. In Christ's name we pray, amen.